part six of our regional Queensland business showcase takes us to the beautiful Sunshine Coast, my part of the world, where we meet one of Queensland's leading restaurateurs along with the co-founder of an entirely new category of yoghurt. It's a tasty episode 572 of the 12-year-old award-winning small business big marketing podcast. Well, I say welcome to a small business marketing show where successful small business owners share their souls to take your marketing straight to the lead. Now, here's your host, Mr. Tim Bowie. And welcome back to your weekly dose of marketing munchies. I'm your host, Timbo Reed, and I have an insatiable curiosity for uncovering marketing strategies and ideas that help businesses, just like yours, to grow. You, so much more importantly, are a motivated business owner and you're ready to crank out some great marketing to build that beautiful business of yours into the empire that it absolutely deserves to be. And that is exactly what we do around here. It's why I do what I do in order to help you grow. As per usual, team, There is marketing G-O-L-D dripping from the ceiling over here at Small Business Big Marketing's HQ. So let's get stuck right in. Have you downloaded my new shortcast called Marketing in Minutes yet? Hope so. You'll find it on the Listener app. It's free to download. Every week I put out a very short episode, five to seven minutes, in which I share a marketing idea that you can implement immediately without spending a fortune. The last couple of weeks, I've uploaded uh, an episode around how to negotiate a celebrity endorsement for your brand. I've shared the trick to never eating alone, why as small business owners, we shouldn't eat alone. There are opportunities out there, team. I explained that in that episode of Marketing in Minutes, plus plenty more. You'll find it on the Listener app, As I said, it's called Marketing in Minutes. This week, we leave Bundaberg behind and head down to the beautiful Sunshine Coast, a home game for me, where we catch up with Spirit House owner Ackland Breity. Now, when it comes to amazing food and surrounds, Spirit House is a Queensland institution, and Ackland is one of the state's leading restaurateurs, and there's plenty of great insights around like customer service, family business, identifying new revenue streams. He's so good at that. But what's especially compelling about my chat with Ackland is that only the day prior, he'd arrived at work to find a guy destroying his beautiful restaurant. (laughs) I get to say that very often, but that's true. So we uh, find out what happened there as well. But first, let's meet another amazing business owner in Sandra Gosling, who along with her husband, Henry, founded the now hugely popular Koyo Coconut Yogurt Range. Now, it was invented in 2010. Do you invent yogurt? I don't know, but you know what I mean. They came up with the idea in 2010 They now turn over $15 million, they will turn over $15 million this year thanks to 51 dedicated staff churning out 2,000 tonnes of coconut yoghurt every year. You're going to love Sandra for a bunch of reasons, including her insights into innovation, her business courage, her fantastic branding and so much more. Here she is describing the light bulb moment that struck Henry at 2 a.m. one morning in 2009. Goodness knows where he came from. I do tell him that I think that actually uh, was born somewhere back in his Fijian history somewhere, goodness knows, and just manifested on that particular morning. It was, I've never seen him so excited. Leapt out of bed. I mean, obviously at 2 or 3 in the morning you're going to say, don't be such a stupid dope, go back to sleep. Um, which I did, and he just raced to the computer and said, I'm going to make yogurt out of coconut milk, got onto the computer and he said, but I guess someone's already doing it, and I wonder if they are, and he found that no one was making coconut yogurt commercially, so he got really excited, and that was the beginning of the journey, and um, that was crazy, so that led to six months of bench testing in my kitchen, there was not one spare piece of bench left. There were yo play containers everywhere. 
as he made yet another batch every night for six is, months. Is this, is this usual in the Gosling household where Henry is a bit of an inventor and has harebrained ideas and then goes off and tries bringing it to life or is this oh, to something? Me it's pretty, always been pretty random. Right. <laughs> Sometimes successfully and most times not. So. Were, were you both looking for a business to start back no, in 2009? No. You were no, easing not into at retirement? All. No, not at all. We, we, we pretty much retired and <laughs> we were doing a bit of property investing and Henry was uh, trying to turn his hand at being um, a builder's mate and having a bit of fun with that and absolutely nothing further from our mind. Well, the, in that case, then you must have had some deep experience in yogurt. <laughs> well, I certainly hadn't. No, he had his career started in the newspaper industry many, many moons ago and when we came to the Sunshine Coast, we started a small business, which drove us crazy for a couple of years, and we ended up selling it. Then Henry actually got a position with Kenilworth Country Foods, who did make a yogurt as part of their range. Now, he managed that company, never went on the floor and made the yogurt. Yeah. So that stemmed a, a question from a friend, a Fijian friend one day. He was visiting, and that friend was actually dealing with um, coconut oil and said to Henry, with your experience in dairy, do you think you could make some coconut butter for me? And Henry said, I have no idea how to make any products at all. I certainly mm -hmm. couldn't make butter. And no, barking up the wrong tree. However, he did say later that maybe that just triggered something mm -hmm. in his brain because it was very soon after that that he came up with the yogurt idea. So that could have triggered something. He was determined was he to do something with coconut. Well, having grown up in Fiji and I guess having experienced the nutritional value, the life-giving value of coconut, he's like, got to do something. But in my experience, watching my dad many years ago ease into retirement, watching friends' dads ease into retirement and mums ease, you ease into retirement. You go, at some point in your mind, you go, I'm slowly going to retire and life's going to become quite amazing, less busy, very enjoyable. Clearly, Henry or you, I know you took a little bit longer to come on board the Koyo train, so to speak, but Henry clearly wasn't 100% convinced that retirement was going to be for him. No, I don't think either of us were, to be honest. Uh -huh. I, I think we thought, well, I guess there's nothing else. Let's just keep on with our property thing and have a bit of fun and do that. But Henry, even now, the retirement word is just not in his vocabulary. So, Well, not now. You're, you're building something very special. Yes. Well, absolutely. And even if we were you know, able to hand over to people who are far more qualified to run this business now than we are. And in fact, we tried to do that a few years ago. And he found that very, very difficult. Okay, Henry's woken up, two o'clock in the morning. He's gone coconut yogurt. He's researched it on Google. Dr. Google said no one else is doing it. Yep. For the next six months, the Gosling kitchen is completely covered in tubs and culture and whatever else goes into yogurt. At what point did you or him or someone go, actually, that's pretty good. I'd buy it and so would everyone else. There was a, a definite moment I was taking each batch to my yoga class in the mornings and I'd take it to the, to the girls and we'd all sit around after our class and we'd have a bit of a taste and, and it was, no, no, yes, no, mm, no, getting there, yes, no. And then one morning in November, it was, do you know what, whatever he did last night, that stuff's him in a mouthful. And that was the moment that I came home and said, right, stop right there, that's it. And so that was it, no more testing and then we took it down to one of our local retailers and, um, you know, like a couple of kids with a couple of teaspoons and a tub of yogurt and, and said, Look, you know, what do you reckon? Do you think this might be a product? And they said, oh, my goodness, if you can make this commercially, we will certainly buy it from you. And so will every other health food store in Australia. So that gave us confidence to go ahead and actually make a, a commercial, our first commercial batch. Am I right in saying you still weren't 100% on board and it, it took a walk along a beach? We did take a walk along a the beach. There were a couple of things that happened. So yes, I was definitely not quite on board. In fact, I was a long way from being on board. I was actually really hedging my best and I wasn't getting in behind him at all. And my sister, in fact, this is a funny story. One day I walked into one of the real estate agents. I started to panic. We spent a lot of money getting into money that, that I thought, where is this going to end? If this doesn't work, we're going to go down the tube. Hey, can, can you put a value? Crazy. How much are we talking? Pretty much at this stage, we put in about half a mil. Wow. 
So we're buying coconut cream, you know, big containers of coconut cream. That was the biggest expense. We had put quite a lot on the line. So you walk into this real estate agent. Yeah, and, I, and I'm panicking. And, and Henry didn't know I was going in. And I said to this guy, I said, look, we've just started a business and it's coconut yogurt. And I wonder if you would have any buyers on your books that might be looking for a little business. And he said, well, what do you think it's worth? And I said, oh, I have absolutely no idea. If I give you a few numbers, do you think you could put a value on it? And he looked at me and he, and he thought I was absolutely crazy. And he said, oh, he said, it's very hard. It's so new. I mean, you know, really, I can't put a value on this. It's all so new. Anyway, I said, oh, well, look, you know, just have a think about it. Look in your client book and see who might be interested because I haven't told my husband yet, but I think we should get rid of this thing. And so I went back home, didn't say anything to Henry. Nothing happened with the real estate agent. So he never got back to me. And in the meantime, momentum had started to build a bit. And funny thing, about three years later, I got a call on the phone. Hi, it's so-and-so from such and such an agency. Do you remember one day you called into me to put this business on the market? Yes, I do remember. He said, have you got a job for me? (laughs) Oh, wow. (laughs) How the tide turns. I had to laugh. I did have to laugh. Well, I also read somewhere where you walked along the beach with Henry during that time and and tell me what washed up on the shore. That was incredible. So we were still still going through this. It was a blustery old day and we had a border collie at home wanting to walk on the beach. So... Off we went and we were really still very dubious about the whole thing. Even Henry was quietly confident, but, you know, there was still a lot of lot of doubt around it, still a bit nervous. Walked up from Coolum up to Perigian Beach and on the way back, it was a blustery day, we were just looking down at the, down at the sand as we walked and muttering away to each other. And next thing, a wave bought a coconut from nowhere and dropped it at our feet. It was covered in barnacles. And he picked it up and he said, I think this has just come all the way from Fiji. (laughs) Amazing. If that isn't a tap on the shoulder by the universe, then the universe is going to give up after that. Absolutely. So we still have the coconut, of course. And oh, that's wonderful. That was definitely a green light. So that was that sealed the deal. Has that coconut got a name? Like, you know, the Wilson the basketball in Tom Hanks's castaway. The coconut needs a name. It hasn't actually. We should Tim? give it a name, shouldn't we? It's I'm not even sure what it looks like. It's a barnacled old thing. The dog did get hold of it once and ripped it ripped, ripped it to bits a little bit. So. <laughs> Sandra, I mean, I could talk to you for hours about how this came to life, but then one thing that leaves me a bit bamboozled is how do you go from a kitchen bench to what are you producing? 2,000 tonnes of yogurt per annum. What do you do? Do you go off and buy a whole lot of plants and machinery? Do you go and outsource it? It was it was progressive. So we, we, we leased a plant out by Gympie for the first probably 12 months. And Henry was driving out there every day, 60K out there early in the mornings, making yogurt, packing the yogurt. Then at one mm-hmm. o'clock in the morning, we live in, in, in Nindiri and in, in behind Yandina mm-hmm. in, in the Sunshine Coast. And one o'clock in the morning... A big truck would trundle up our driveway. We're on a small acreage and we could hear it at one o'clock. Sometimes it was wet and rainy, middle of the winter, and we thought, oh, here it comes. You could hear it rumbling up the road. We'd get out in our gumboots and dressing gowns and unload this yogurt onto trolleys and cart it off through the muddy paddocks into the cool room that we had at the back of the property. So we did that for about two years. Uh, Yeah, about two years. And then we moved into um, our very first uh, plant that we put in ourselves. We leased the premise and we built our own plant. I was once again terrified that it was going to be too big. We were out of that in two years. So then we went into our next um, uh, next plant and we built more. We built it in modules. So uh, we had, we had, I think we ended up with 25 cool rooms all linked by little tunnels. Oh, how fantastic. <laughs> as, sort of, as the business grew, we'd just add another cool room and cut another hole in the wall so we could walk through it and it was it was a crazy way to do, do it. Do you look back on those days fondly or you do you look and go, oh, my God, I'm glad we're, we're through it? I never want to oh, see that again. I must say I'm glad we're through it, although yeah. I, there were such precious moments and I have so many memories of it all. And our son, Jonathan, is very involved in the business, as were other members of our family. And sadly, um, our son, who's who started the business with us, or one of our sons, um, he sadly passed away three years into the business. 
with cancer very quickly and he was heavily involved. So that was such a devastating moment or time in our lives that I think we had to, to get through that. I think we had to create something much bigger than our grief. So we really raised the energy levels to deal with it. And so that was in um, 2013. So that was the moment we looked back on. I looked back on how hard Mike worked and what a part of the business mm. he was. And um, so, you know, it's amazing how things, you know, happen. It certainly wasn't going to stop us. It put us up in our tracks. You might could have hated that. So off we went again. And, yes, I have wonderful memories. We pulled um, Jonathan, our youngest son, back from Bali where he was living the life with his partner, Jess, and they had two dear little boys that they had uh, had been born in Bali. And so when Henry had this idea, he he um, he rang Jono, who was a designer, rang Jono and said, Jono, I've got this idea about coconut yogurt. I wonder if you can do me a bit of a logo, send it through to me. And Jono had heard so many of these crazy ideas before, but he yeah. just said, yes, yeah, sure, Dad, no problem. And so he sent him through a bit of cheap clip art and just said, <laughs> Okay, this will do. That's fine. It's a co with a coconut tree in the middle and a yo. That'll do. And believe it or not, it's still our logo today. Well, I was going to ask you about your branding because I, I, it, it's beautiful. I mean, it, it really is beautiful. You've created this premium FMCG supermarket brand that seems to have come out of nowhere that – is right for its time, given veganism is on the rise and vegetarian and all that, all that stuff. It just, it's just a, it's a perfect storm that your brand visually and aesthetically meet has met that demand perfectly. So well done to you and to your son and even yes, the energy that's, that's that definitely John and Jess, yeah. Yeah, but even that energy of losing your your son Mike, and I'm I'm so sorry to hear that, but I it, it maybe that's his way of giving to the brand, and yeah, it's it's it, really it, special. It, it it was, and and um and still is, and we just knew that we had to we had to rise out of that, otherwise there's a big deep hole. You don't want to fall into mm. that, so we just had to lift ourselves right up out of that, create huge energy from that. And and it, and it gave us yet another um, step up and a reason to, to, to really get into this. The fast-moving consumer good market is a tough one. Uh, you, you're not Kraft. You're not Nestle. Maybe one day they'll buy you, but that's down the track. Uh, you are competing for shelf space. You are competing against brands like a, a YoPlay or, or whatever that have huge budgets I'm not a vegan. I'm not a vegetarian. I like yogurt, but I know Koyo well. How have you managed to create such awareness and penetration so quickly with, I'm guessing, a modest budget? Yes, very modest budget. And um, it, it, that has been an interesting journey. So we started by doing our own, um, Henry and I would just do in store tastings. That's how we, I mean, we after making it, packing it, selling it, delivering it, we would then go in, into stores on the weekends and get it into people's mouths. So mm-hmm. it started off like that. So we became very became very personal, I guess, with our buyers and, with, and our consumers. So that was all we could really afford to do in those days. And then, of course, as the market grew, and our niche market was definitely dairy-free, the health food markets was our niche. That was fine. In the first two years, we had no competitors. It was just us. And then the competitors started coming in and we realised very quickly that we had to get it ahead of this. So the, the awareness around the product was moving from that quite strict, narrow, uh, vegetarian, uh, lactose-free, dairy-free market into more of a flexitarian, middle-majority market and became more of a gourmet product. So now it's not just about the fact that it doesn't have dairy in it, um, it's got wonderful um, lauric acid from the coconut in it, it's more than that. It's, I mean, it, it, it was the taste and the deliciousness of the product that was actually mm. the, the, the selling point. That was it. Well, so it doesn't it, matter if you're lactose-free, still enjoy it. It's a great example of the, the quote, which is the best marketing is a great product, and you meet that. Tell me about a price. I... It's not cheap. Koyo at a price point is one of the more expensive yogurts on the supermarket shelf. 
Is that, and I don't know whether you can reveal this, but is that a positioning strategy for you or is it actually really expensive to make? And you It's can- very expensive to make the product that we make, yes. So it's all about the strength of the coconut milk and, of course, we place huge value on the functionality of coconut. So we're not going to, you know, have a very um, diluted, watered-down product without very much coconut value. And so obviously the more the more coconut... Also, we have our probiotics um, and our prebiotics and all of the ingredients we used are certified organic, the highest functionality we can find. So we we really went to the top of the shelf for everything. Now, that's expensive and products kept coming in for a lot less than we could even make the product for. So we've had to sort of think, okay, you know, where are we positioned? We still, and it was never a, never a, a strategy, to be the best, we just wanted to be the best, not thinking about a strategy in particular. But it's actually worked out that way. Mm. And so you find that some of these bigger stores, they will have a, a good, better, best strategy. And so we always sit at, at there at the best. But we have to find efficiencies in our own operation to try and keep that price at what it is. Yeah. Or the, the alternative is to compromise the quality of the product, which we'll never do. I'm a bit of a domain name watcher and you have a very, very good domain name, fourletters.com, koyo.com. That couldn't have existed on the primary market. You didn't just go to GoDaddy and buy that for $9.99. No. Uh, How did that come about? You obviously tracked down whoever owned it. Yes, that was Jono. Not cheap. No. <laughs> Weren't we lucky? I know. Well, I don't know. You, if you were lucky if you got it cheap, but to me, that's that's a domain name worth no, hundreds of thousands it, of dollars. It, it wasn't cheap, no, but um, and actually wasn't available when we first applied for it. So we had to do a little bit of juggling there. Yeah, and no doubt. And it was doubt. a company that had nothing to do with coconut yogurt. And so, um, yes, so we managed to uh, acquire that, which was wonderful. All this growth and mad harebrained ideas, and I think at one point you might have even said to Henry, you've gone crazy in the coconut, uh, probably with a smile on your dial, but did it ever put a strain on what appears to be a a wonderful marriage? And if it did, how did you work through it? (laughs) I think I probably, after all these years, got so used to my crazy husband that (laughs) I I had really been past letting him drive me crazy. I think we just manage to stay out of each other's way sometimes when it all gets yeah, that yeah. much. You just know. You <laughs> I, know go, it's not- I hit the garden and he hit something yeah. else and and we just get over it. I mean, it is always difficult. We we, we are so different. We are chalk and cheese. And so um, maybe that's a good thing. I'm not sure. But but we, uh, yeah, we, we've got a great relationship and we certainly, uh, we usually find something to laugh about or whatever. But yes, there are certainly times when there's steam coming out our ears. <laughs> Can you believe where it is at in August 2021, no. Sandra? No, I pinch myself, Tim. Mm. I pinch myself. I think this is, this is great. I, I, I drive into our facility now, which is where the big pineapple in, on Sunshine Coast is. And we have a wonderful facility there that we moved into two years ago. It is just wonderful. The first time that we've really built a proper facility. Mm. And I drive in there sometimes and I see all the cars and I see all the wonderful people. And, of course, it's all about the people that you take on the journey with you. Mm. And I pinch myself and I think, this is ridiculous. This is great. And I feel so responsible. for. I feel so overwhelmed an overwhelming feeling of responsibility to everybody that um, has joined us. I think, gosh, you know, during COVID times and things got a little bit tough and I thought, oh, people, we have people working with us that joined, that have been with us from the year one. And so we've got that solid core of wonderful people and we couldn't have done it without them. Well, I, I think it's absolutely tremendous. I think it's tremendous, a great brand. It's wonderful that it's coming out of regional Queensland on the little old Sunshine Coast, where everyone's moving anyway, so you know it'll be it'll be the big old Sunshine Coast pretty soon. Yes, well, but, it um, already is going. Sandra, thank you so much for making the time and, and telling us the Koyo story because I think it's fantastic. Well done to you and Henry. You're very welcome, Tim. Thank you for the chat. Well, there you go, team. Koyo's Sandra Gosling, such a great story. 
I love how Coconut washed up on the beach in front of her as she was in the middle of deciding whether to go all in or not with Henry's big idea. And I love how they've still got the, the coconut. Good reminder. I also love the visual brand they've created. It stands out. It stands out on crowded supermarket shelves. Like how competitive a space is that? It's got a solid premium feel and it's full of personality. I also love how in the early days they rolled up the sleeves and got personal with their buyers and consumers by doing as many in-store taste tests as they could. Nothing beats eye to eye, does it, in this virtual world that we live in. And Koyo is a great example of the best marketing being a great product. You know, this is so important when you have a modest marketing budget and are going up against brands and competitors with much deeper pockets. A great product or a great service wins every time. That's what grabbed my attention. What grabbed yours? Give me a buzz. 0480 015150. Righto, let's meet second generation Spirit House co-founder Ackland Briarty. Now, let me describe Spirit House to you. It is a restaurant, but it is so much more than a restaurant. It is a total experience. I know that sounds like wanky marketing talk, but trust me, Spirit House is an experience. It's set on beautiful acres of land. You are in the bush, surrounded by huge bamboos. They serve modern Asian food. The restaurant itself is it's sort of all the tables and rooms sit around this beautiful lake. You feel like you're in like Thailand or Bali. It's quite incredible. Um, it's beautiful at night. It's beautiful in the day. And the food's incredible. But they have cooking classes. They've got merch. They've got tours. They do so much in terms of adding additional revenue streams. And that's what I really like about Ackland. Now, like I said earlier, whilst Ackland has some great insights into business and marketing, what makes my chat with him especially interesting is that just the day before, he'd arrived at work only to find a guy destroying his business. Here's Ackland describing what happened. Uh, to be honest, it looked like uh, a bomb had gone off in the building. It was insane. Um, the total restaurant kitchen was just destroyed. The the person had fallen through the roof and then just to proceed to destroy every bit of equipment, um, wine, bottles, the fire extinguishers were let off everywhere. Um, yeah, and then they went over to the cooking school and um, started to go to work on that as well. What about that beautiful garden setting that surrounds Spirit House? Is that all intact or did the person manage to have a crack at that as well? No, thank God he was a garden lover and he left that alone. Ah, good. What do they say? A silver lining in every cloud. What what, uh, what was your immediate reaction? To be honest, at, at first... We really had no idea. Um, the person was still in the in the building and... Um, it's really hard when you're looking at someone basically um, destroying your business. But my brother was on site and handled him amazingly, uh, obviously realised there's a mental health thing going on here and was able to calm him down and said, hey, mate, you know, um, are you OK? Um, you know, you're not doing well, are you? Because he was there with no pants on, basically um, destroying everything about him. And uh, my brother was able to, you know, talk calmly to him and get him out and then once we got him on his way with the help of uh, Queensland police advising us what to do, we were able to go back in and then just assess it. But it was literally like no one can believe that one person did this amount of damage. Yeah, I, I've looked at some of the insane. photos. I mean, if you just Google Spirit House break-in and, and look at some oh, really? of the Google images, you know, like, yeah, uh, yeah I mean, it is. It's, it's, it's devastating. And, it's, and uh, it's, it's interesting speaking to someone, a business owner, who is right in the middle of, you know, devastation. Normally it'd be like six months on, we'd be having a chat going, oh, you experienced that, how'd you get through it? Sure. But mm. you're right in the middle. Clearly a strong mindset, Acklin. I get the sense that you are a glass half full kind of guy. Do you know, I, I think what it is, because obviously we're going to talk about a lot today, it's you, you can call up in a ball and do nothing or you can just take some sort of action and look, well, what else can we do? And I, I think that's... That is the key of um, any successful business really is when something uh, comes to you that affects you adversely. It's a matter of, all right, uh, you know, what's the saying? You know, you, when you get handed lemons, you make lemonade. And I know right. it's trite and boring, but some people are just good at it and they're happy to do it, um, whereas other people just shut shop and, you know, wait for it all to blow over and we're a lot more proactive. 
I think it's really beautiful how you or your brother, whoever asked the fellow if he's okay, because sure. obviously the the other the other option was to go hard at him and you know take him out for a person who's destroyed your business. But you know, I was at Spirit House on Saturday night with my beautiful Sarah, and we had, a, had an incredible dinner. And one of the first things you get asked when you go to Spirit House, or at least in our experience, was, "Are you here for any special occasion?" And I think that's a really lovely question, and it ties into what your brother asked because I don't think enough times as business owners or as human beings, we check in to see how where the other person's at. If it's a customer, how are they feeling about being here or why are they here? It gives us insight into what we're dealing with, right? I think you've absolutely hit the nail on the head and I thought it was, um, it's, it's probably something that drives our business. And as you know, this business is multi-generational now, you know, um, mum and dad have always been in businesses, but, and, and I know it's tried, but it's not, it's, um, it's about the people and uh, it's about our staff. And that was probably our major concern. When we looked at the damage, everything's repairable. Yeah. But I've got 52 people that depend on this for their mortgages, you know, their families need the, need this business to work, you know, and, and that's a, a lot of responsibility. And even during uh, COVID, you know, the stuff that we did with the guys to make sure that they were financially secure was um, amazing and um, reported about, you know, so it's a real, you, you have a responsibility. And I guess that's another reason too, why we just don't crawl up in a ball because there's 52 people looking for you, you know, where are we going from here? What, what are we doing? Acklin, you've probably also had to uh, have rung many, many, many clients who have been excited to go to Spirit House for anniversaries, birthdays, some special event, because that's what Spirit House is all about. What's the reaction been? Oh, no, they're all understanding. You know, no, that's, no doubt. that was fine. Yeah. And, and it's the same. It was, um, you know, I hope you guys bounce back, uh, et cetera, like that. Uh, and that response that uh, we got from the public was absolutely overwhelming. Um, I can't remember how many comments we're at now, but it's probably two or 3,000, you know. So that wow. was, yeah, it was insane. How does that yeah. make you feel? It's, it's funny, actually. Uh, I've never really thought about that. I, I I really wanted to talk about a successful business, you know, and you think, well, we're a successful business. Uh, what does that mean? But it was... Hey, it- I, I, I'm going to interrupt there. We, we are talking about a successful business because it is such a Sunshine Coast, if not Australian culinary institution. You know, we're going to get to the success part, mate, but, you know, there is absolutely... It's fascinating to hear how you're handling this, and I think it's really beautiful. Sure. So, so uh, yeah, so just to finish that question, it was... Um, it, it was uh, I, I didn't realise we had so much engagement. There you go, mm-hmm. with, with the audience, you know. Like any business, we put the photos up and we put a post up, and, and I don't expect it to be looked at or liked or shared. I... I and... Yeah, we're not great at it. But when I saw that, you know, two and a half thousand people took the time to comment, it made me realise that, hey, maybe we are special. You, you kind of lose sight of that for really a while, you know. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. But, yeah. I've not really thought about it as much until you just asked me that question. There you go. Thank you for, for that honesty because mm. you are the custodian, uh, mm-hmm. third generation owner of, second generation, I should say, owner with your brother, Yep. of a Sunshine Coast eating institution. One of my qu- first questions prior to all this happening and having to re-engineer this interview ever so slightly was, uh-huh. is there a weight attached to being that person who is responsible for such a fantastic place to eat and celebrate and be? Yes. And th- the weight is this... And it might be self-imposed. In business, we say, you know, your staff, your most valuable asset, and and that's great. But the biggest struggle for us, because we've been here now nearly 24, 25 years in business, and it's it's staying relevant. And, you know, why, why are we trying to stay relevant? And it's not about the money, and that's something I'd love to chat about a little bit later, but it's about, hey, not only does my livelihood depend on this, you know, and my family, but there's 52 other people that need Spirit House to work, and and they're all in this together. You know, as someone who lives in Noosa, knowing that Mm -hmm. Spirit House is there is a really beautiful thing. I get a sense that this kind of conversation makes you feel awkward, and I'm sorry about that, and if you want to move on, I will, but... It is really lovely to know that there are institutions out in the hinterland of Noosa that 
are so well regarded and so established. And, you know, you help define that area. And I think it's really cool. And I'm really honoured to be speaking to you as a result of that. Yeah, I just thought there's so many behind the scenes things of Spirit House and and how we got to where we are now through through the journey of me growing up with my parents and their businesses that I thought was was kind of intriguing. And I think it's exact, exactly as you said, we're, we're a bit of a destination. Mm. Um, we're certainly... Um, an icon to the coast, but the how did how did all this evolve and the um, the lessons we've learnt from doing that is yeah it, it's something that we love to share with other people and it's kind of funny that so few people really ask you know you, you think as having said that we do get some cooking schools or people that want to start cooking schools ring us up and say you know can we come up and meet with you guys for a couple of days and find out how to do it and we're more than happy to share that you know and i think a, a podcast like yours is just brilliant because you're kind of having the conversations that most people want to have with other successful business yeah, owners yeah. but they don't initiate yeah 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 i get it i totally get it you mm. you uh, were handed the keys so to speak you and your brother to the spirit house a few years ago when when mum passed away and I'm and I'm sorry uh-huh. ab- about that uh, how, uh-huh. you obviously knew those keys were coming your way what was the conversation did you have a conversation with mum and dad or was it just with dad when those keys were being handed over I'm speaking metaphorically obviously but no 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 what you're saying about is really true do you know what in a funny way Tim I don't think we were really being handed those keys at all. Um, I think as a business evolves and as you grow older in the business, your needs change. I think mum was 72, dad was uh, 79, 80, and I think they were looking to sell. So my brother and I didn't really factor into the longevity of the spirit house at all because when you're 70 and 80 years old, you have a very different need for the business than what I, I do at 55 and my brother at 53. We have very different visions and very different energies. So that to me was, that was dropped on me and my brother. So we decided that, no, we're going to do this and we're going to do it bigger and we're going to do it better and we're going to, you know, put new life in it because we want this thing to be here 20 years for our kids. Your, your dad's still around? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And does yeah. he sit back directing the traffic or has he said, boys, it's yours? Uh, he's pretty much said, Boy, it's, boys, it's yours. Um, yeah. yeah, but he's, he's no, declining mentally because he's 84 years old, yeah. Mate, and, so am um, I. I'm 54. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> does yeah. he know about what happened yesterday? No. Not going to No, it would stress him too much. He, no, it would stress him too much. As I said, their default thing was uh, let's sell. And um, and I think that's still going, uh, you know, at 84 years old, he sells and he's set for the rest of his life. Whereas Blake and I are, no, let's keep this going. We have more to do. Uh, and we have a recipe, uh, which I'd love to share with your listeners. And uh, we've learnt valuable lessons by watching them in their businesses. And, um, yeah, we, we, we feel we have more to give and we can mm-hmm. take this into you know, the next 20 years. Yeah, wow. That's really interesting. And I I want to hear your recipe, but I would just ask around being an institution. Sometimes institutions are institutions because they don't change and they don't evolve. And I'm thinking right now of a restaurant in Melbourne. I won't name it, but it's a French restaurant. And it's been the same. Well, I've been been going there for, I'd say, 30 years. And honestly, I don't think it's changed one bit. The menu hasn't changed. Maybe the odd staff member has. But I think that's a real positive because sometimes we just love to know that things are are the same as they've always been. Spirit House, clearly you and your brother Blake have evolved and have contemporised it. Have You know, if I was to go to Spirit House 30 years ago, it sounds like it would have been a different experience to what I had on Saturday night. Yes, you're, you're right. I was just thinking what you said and I think that's where the twist is and um, on exactly what you said. It's a fine line. You are walking a tightrope of maintaining this wonderful institution but pulling it, maybe kicking and screaming, maybe not, into the 21st century. Yes and no, and I think this is where we're different and I love that analogy of the French restaurant and I will say, hand on heart, if I wanted a successful restaurant and I wanted consistency and I have no qualms, probably one of the most successful, most brilliant restaurants out there is McDonald's and it makes more money than we do as a percentage, delivers a consistent product and, you know, it, it's an amazing business model. Mm. I, I think the different, the difference for us, and they have to be consistent, 
and I think this was the thing that probably a lot of people don't get. Um, and I, do, do you want to talk dollars or? Mate, uh, I, you go for it. Yeah, what is, okay. Well, yeah. you know, incorporate dollars into what is your recipe for success? I think the thing for what we learned from mum and dad was um, they just didn't care what they did as long as it was fun. And that, to me, when I look at all the businesses they had and what they created, they were always fun businesses. Uh, it was fun for the staff and it was fun for the customers and the experience was was fun. And that's Misty's Restaurant in 72 that they started for those that go back there and then the Montfort Pottery after that and various other businesses. So when you talk about a French restaurant in Victoria doing the same thing for 25 years, I, I have no doubt that that as a business model is fine and we could do that here. But what, what my brother and I look at is... Well, what would be really fun to do? And one of the fun things we thought would be to do would be to start taking people overseas on food tours to Thailand because I speak Thai and I was there for two years. And that this is back in the 80s, but that's how Spirit House became Thai through a series of weird adventures that we ended up here. So we had a database, very important to market to, but rather than market, hey, we're the Spirit House restaurant, come and dine with us. It was like, um, you know, do you want to come to Thailand with us initially? And don't get me wrong, when this started out, out, it was just eight people paying $300 a day for four days in Bangkok, tagging along with me as we explored street food and and various other things. And, um, you know, uh, up to Ayutthaya to look at the origin of Thai food, I guess, um, from there. That was fun. And then we thought, well, let's go to India because we met an Indian DMC. So that tour developed into a 12-day Indian tour looking at the same thing, street food, culture, different, not just Taj Mahal, but a whole heap of things. And then Myanmar came online. So now we're doing tours to, tours to Myanmar. Mm. And then Thailand expanded to become 12 days to include Cambodia. And then one of our head chefs left to Indonesia. He was there for 15 years, speaks fluent Indonesian. So now we charter a um, an eight cabin luxury dive boat and do these amazing tours through these awesome. exotic Ind- islands yeah. in Indonesia for 12 days. That idea that started off with eight people at 300 bucks pre-COVID soon became an $800,000 part of our business. Now, wow. if I had to generate $800,000 more for the, at, in a restaurant, I, I wouldn't have been able to do it. I'm limited Not by CT. Exactly. I'm limited by CT. I'm limited by staff um, capacity and everything else. So for us, we were always looking at these... Um, these sidelines, but everything would be, you know, India was like, what would be fun to do? What would be fun to do? Fun for our customers and yeah. fun for us. I just wanted to preface that with one more thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was that we take our staff on these adventures oh, you're with us. Good. Yeah, you are good. So, you know, now it's Can fun for job? them. Can I I'll exactly. be the barista. Yeah, you know what I mean? So fun was always what could be fun, but what can I do? People always try to do more with their customers, get them back to spend them more, get them to do it more often, all that sort of stuff. But ours was, what else could we be doing with these guys that we could take them on a journey with us, you know, and that journey might be so different to dining in a restaurant. There you go. What you have been very, very good at is adding multiple revenue streams to a restaurant. And you and I have had a previous discussion, and let's touch touch on that in a minute, which is what are other restaurants and cafes getting wrong? Because you said to me the other day, you can feel physically ill when you Mm. see a cafe that you know Mm. is going to fail. Now, Mm -hmm. um, what you have, let's just, the multiple revenue streams is just such an obvious, interesting and much needed strategy, not only in your industry, but in many, but you've got, you've got your restaurant, you've got takeaway, you've got frozen foods, you've got the cooking school, cookbooks, functions, tours, merchandise. I even saw beautiful crockery and cutlery and glassware. Nice, and yeah. you, mate, you, I, I just think it's, it's obvious, but clearly not so obvious because many don't do it. And what you, what we've learned from you is the question that you ask is, um, we don't care what we do as long as we have fun. So how, how totally. else can we have fun at the Spirit House beyond just getting people back to eat more? So totally. well done to you. Totally. We don't have the blinkers on to think that we're just a restaurant. And the cooking school, as you said, is a perfect adjunct to the um, to a restaurant business as well. What do you see? What really frustrates you when you look at some businesses that you drive past and go, how are they going to survive? I, I don't mean it lightly. I, I really do. I look at um, someone that might be opening. I'm thinking of a little Thai restaurant that some, uh, I'm going to say friends of ours have just opened up and I know it's not going to work and they've got two young kids and they're locked into a lease and they're going to be working, you know, 80 hours a week. The kids are 
you know, at the back of the restaurant studying or doing whatever they're doing. And you know, that's not a lifestyle. That's not a, a thing. But I think what Gerber said uh, in the E-Myth, he might oh, not have said it in the E-Myth. It might have been in a seminar out here or a workshop that he did. I just go, uh, and a, a business should be about not taking life away from you, but bringing, giving you more life. Does that, does that make sense? 100%. And, yeah, and what I wanted to say to you really was, and, and I'm happy to talk money if you wanted, was that, you know, when people ask me about, you know, what do you do or, you know, and you say you have a restaurant and they go, well, where is it? It's at Yandino and, you know, it's so boring to them. And you say, oh, and, you know, we have cookbooks and they go, well, ho-hum, you know, we've got a cooking school and that's still not interesting, you know, and, and we do tours. But when I say to them, you know, oh, and we turned over $6 million last year, then that's like, wow, that means you're successful, you're, you know, you know, this is an amazing business. This is a success story, a success story. But for my brother and I, it, it's not about the money. We, Mum and Dad didn't start this for the money. Mum and Dad started this because they wanted to create a little patch of Thailand because they thought that would be cool, you know, and wanted to do some morning tea, a lunch and an afternoon tea, throw in some Asian food as well, you know, and... I, I was thinking there's a lot of people out there that have got restaurants or businesses and it doesn't need to be making million dollars. If, if that business provides and gives you the security and the lifestyle mm -hmm. that you love living, they're more power to you. My parents, though... The business, it was all about the business because they had so much fun in the business. You know, they enjoyed the business and that was their life and that was their their lifestyle. So that's why they were able to jump from, he, my dad was a cattle buyer, mum was a librarian, they opened a wine cellars in Armadale in Victoria, then they had a restaurant, mum was a chef, never cooked before, dad was a waiter. they have the wine cellars in High Street, Armadale? Yeah, in High oh, Street. Oh, yeah. you're joking, yeah. I lived opposite yeah. those. Yeah, Isn't really. Yeah. Ecklin, I've got to ask you: Is there a sure. mo has there been a moment in your in your business life, your business journey, where it was all about the money, and it failed? No. Uh, oh, for mum and dad. Oh, for Not either. For me. Yeah. Not for uh, you? No. One time there was one brilliant question. There was. Uh, um, some uh, accountants approached mum and dad and asked if they would like to um, do a restaurant for them for a group of investors, you know, because mum and dad had a successful restaurant here in Yandina and they could do it anywhere and, and they did this restaurant and it never worked. It didn't cost anyone any money. Uh, the investors probably lost money, but it was through the accounting firm. But it was the same thing. When you looked at the restaurant, there was um, a couple of key ingredients, which I'd love to explore with your listeners if you want, that were missing. And I just kind of knew when they did it. I just thought, you know, you're doing this for the wrong reasons. You're doing this for the money. You know, there's, there's nothing. What know. were the two things that were missing? I was thinking the other day, why do people go to Paris? Why do they go to Rome? Why do they go to Athens? You know, why do, why do they travel? What do they go to do? People like to look at stuff. It's pretty simple. Do you know what I mean? I go to Paris, mm -hmm. I want to look at the Eiffel Tower. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we've always created in our business, and it's um, a recipe for our success, is it's that experience that it wasn't just about the food. It was there was something to look at. You know, there was something to do. And there happened to be something to eat as well. And it doesn't really matter what your business is. There's no reason why it can't be an experience. Um, there was a really cute little bank in Bangkok, a branch of, um, it wasn't Bangkok Bank, but it was. I'm going to use that as an example. And they'd set it up like a old-timey Western, you know, bank branch that you'd see in a, in a country, in, in a Western film, you know, with the leather chair and the guys in the leather aprons. You know, it was still a functioning bank, but it was just the experience. So people, you know, wanted to go there. But my point is, if I was a plumber, it doesn't take much to jump on Alibaba to go and look at unusual tapware and plug fittings and various other things and open up your own little showroom and still do your plumbing business and you could put a coffee machine in there and people could come in and, you know, not look at the boring, you know what I mean? It's 100%. We created amazing experiences where there was something to look at. It was more than just about the food and that if I was to do any other business, it was always be what's unique about this and what would bring people here? What do you um, say to, to, to restaurateurs, and there's, there's many, many business type owners listening to this, but sure. to restaurateurs that know Spirit House and go, well, hang on, Ackland, you have hectares of the most beautiful bamboo, you have sure. an incredible lake in the middle of your sure. restaurant, you have all these statues, you have little constructions, Buddhas, and there's all sorts of stuff going on. You've got all that. All sure. I've got 
is four walls on a high street and you're sure. telling me I need to create things to look at and do? I'm being, yeah. well... No, 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 I, no, no. I, understanding, I understand exactly but... what you mean. No, 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 it's, it's perfect. I think anyone that said that to us would have to understand that if we had our choice knowing what we knew about restaurants, we would probably want four walls and, you know, <laughs> a kitchen on High Street because that's where the foot traffic is. People need to understand that what we had at Spirit House, it wasn't by design. It was purely by accident. We we were, I'm sitting on a hydroponic farm. That's what I'm sitting on. It just, and mum and dad were building a uh, house on the grounds and they had a little tropical garden to go in first for their house. It just happened that the highway was supposed to come through the middle of this property and it was a three-year plan and it was oh, well, there's no point in having a house here because it could be a highway or it could be next to a highway because it was also slated to go through next door. So we better do something. Do you know what I mean? It is that mm. turning adversity. Mm. And so we we were had imported from Thailand years ago with the pot, Montville Pottery. So we started bringing in pots and had a bit of a nursery going on. And then when we found out that the highway was going through next door, we were kind of committed then to keep that nursery, and then we just put that little building across the lake to become a, an, an eatery with Asian food. This was not a, a design. This is two people coming, all right, this is the hand that we've been dealt. How are we going to play that hand, you know? And no one's got a gun to anyone's head to make them go and rent a restaurant on a high street with four walls and a kitchen. But if you're already in that situation, I'd be looking at it. And when we did the Hong Sa bar, we also had four walls. I just went and put 650 Buddha heads on one of the back walls. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Why have four when you can have 650, you know? So, you know, it, it yeah. You, you raise the whole I- issue, uh, conversation for another time, Eklund, but the, the whole idea of just creating customer experiences is pretty critical in a day and age where there's so much product and service and business parity. Everything's the Indeed. same. So, sure. you know, it's the experience that's going to set us apart. Mate, I, honestly, I could talk to you for hours. I'm grateful that you still found the time despite, you know, having the beautiful spirit house experienced so much damage yesterday morning. You'll recover, I have no doubt. Uh, You'll rise from the ashes bigger and better than ever and probably you're going to sit down with your staff over the coming weeks and ask the question, I don't care what we do, guys, but as long as we have fun. So how are we going to have fun? (laughs) And it's a great question. Indeed, it absolutely is. It absolutely is and, yeah, who knows what we might become, you know. Good on you, buddy. We'll make sure you... Make sure you keep the uh, the bookings open. Spirithouse.com.au is where you can book to go and have a beautiful dinner with After Ackland. The next six or eight weeks, though. <laughs> six or eight weeks away, yeah, and plus you are going to yeah. be smashed once you reopen. Um, and I thoroughly uh, encourage people to have the grilled water buffalo because it's very it was spectacular. Ackland, thank you for sharing, mate, and uh, I look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. Thank you, Tim. It's been a pleasure. Well, there you go, team. Spirit House co-owner Ackland Briarty. What a great fellow and what a story. What timing, hey, to get him the day after he's found a fellow in his business. He's handled it pretty well, I must say. Seriously, if you ever find yourself on the Sunshine Coast, be sure to drop by Spirit House for a feed or a cooking class or just a look around. If you are going to do that, I suggest booking ahead because not easy to get into. What grabbed your attention from that chat? I would so love to know. Call me, 0480-015-150. Hope you enjoyed the sixth instalment of this series showcasing amazing businesses in regional Queensland. Next week, we head further south and inland to Toowoomba, where we hear from Bryce Cap, who owns and runs, wait for it, a global wallpaper design business that's actually smashing it locally and in the States. Plus, we meet third-generation jeweller Lockie Hogan, who shares some great insights into taking over his family's 70-year-old jewellery business. Hey, if you'd like a copy of my book to learn about how to create helpful marketing, it's called The Boomerang Effect, and you'll find it at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. If you loved the podcast and you got this far, which kind of tells me you have, you do love it, You'll find 571 more episodes on your favourite podcast app. As has been the case for the past 12 years, this podcast was presented by me, Timbo Reid, the music played by rock star Lockie Doley, and all glued together by producer Romy Scher. Thanks, guys. Until next time, thank you so much for tuning in. May your marketing be the absolute best marketing. Bye for now.